So I hope last week you listened to After the Catastrophe, um, Carl Jung's essay that I put up. If you didn't go back and listen to that, it's good stuff. It gives some insight like all those essays um, that I've covered give us on um, events going on today. But I want to get back into this theme of going beyond li neoliberalism. And last time when I talked about this, I talked about ground level paths out. And this time I'd like to talk about paths out in faith and thought. Because as it turns out, those are two major ways into political ideology. And what we're talking about here is ideological possession. So you know if you've listened to those essays that Jung thought that, that um, the ideologies of the 20th century that killed so many millions of people fascism, Nazism, communism, um, were cases of mass ideological possession. I just want to cover some of the main traits of someone who is ideologically possessed. Now granted, this is from my reading of Jung and also my observations as a human being as, as well as a political uh, theorist, but one of the main signs of an ideological, ideologically possessed person is if they have that crusading mentality if they are literally on a mission and the type of person who kind of eats, drinks, sleeps, and pretty much lives their political thought. Such a person is typically unidimensional and what I mean by that is that they don't seem to have a life outside of that. That is their go-to for everything and they see everything including you through that lens. And such a person tends to lack a sense of humor um, not that every person with a lack of humor at all is an ideologically possessed crusader, so we don't want to make that mistake. Inevitably, the crusader lacks real humor. Sometimes they can crack a good joke, but it's pretty strategic. To have a sense of humor, you have to stop and observe and kind of interact with your environment, whereas the ideologically possessed crusader tends to only um, basically interact with his environment um, in order to manipulate it. The Crusader speaks in apocalyptic or millennial terms, meaning, you know, the, things are bad now, but they're going to be, like, way better in the future. They're going to be perfect in the future when my ideology takes over, and then it will be like heaven on earth. You will, you know, everything will be fixed, and all we have to do is get rid of those who are evil, who hold evil ideas, who practice evil ways, it's, it's very um, kind of like a child's fairy tale mentality in a way. They have a willingness to dehumanize those who disagree with them. They put people into categories and those who are in the way um, become less than human. And this is always a problem because it doesn't always have to move in this direction, but it tends to be a first step towards uh, abusing people in some way. Those who are possessed are blind to facts that don't support the story that they hold. Ideologically possessed people are unable to adjust to changing circumstances. They just keep doggedly going down the same path. It's part of not being able to admit any facts that don't support your story. If you've tried something and it doesn't work, you just haven't tried hard enough. It's kind of the rain dance mentality. You know, if I, if the, if I do the rain dance and it doesn't rain, it's not that there's something wrong with my thinking, uh, that rain dances have something to do with rain. It's that I didn't do the dance well enough. So we got to double down on that dance. There's never going to be any thought about, maybe we shouldn't do that dance anymore. Maybe it doesn't work anymore. Or, a gasp, maybe it never did. Crusaders are unable to make, admit mistakes, imperfections, and wrongs in themselves. They can see it in others, but they can't see it, or if they do see it, they'll never admit it in themselves. They project themselves as knowing that they're right about everything, never doubting. And uh, this is a very, very attractive way to be for other people. I mean, this is exactly the type of thing that attracts people, is, is that huge self-confidence. All right, and then finally, their relationships are subject to ideological commitment and interpretation. You know you've got a crusader when they cannot abide by friends, let alone romantic relationships, with people who 
disagree with them politically. More on that in a moment. But before I get to that, signs of expulsion. You know that you have met someone who is coming out of possession or never was ideologically possessed if he has these signs. And I say expulsion instead of exorcism because I think probably, um, well, I mean, there's, a re there's actually a serious reason for that. When you decide or you become untethered from your um, overwhelming ideology, you're going to lose not only many people in your life, but you're going to lose your sense of um, safety and security and uh, sort of comfortable belonging. And uh, the world is going to feel a little bit more um, unstable. And so you, you may feel expelled, you know, to a certain extent from your context. Uh, but so signs of expulsion include someone who is a doer and not a talker. Uh, a person who's a crusader wants to convert you and learns how to talk and make arguments and has all the points to try to convince people. Um, but what do they do? Ask yourself, what do they do? And does what they do conform with what they say? For instance, left or right, if they say that they care about the poor, what are they doing about it? I mean, personally. An expelled person is multidimensional. There are a lot of different facets to his life and his personality. Um, he has a sense of humor because of that. It's easier to have a sense of humor when you're actually observing the life around you. A lot of things uh, elicit a sense of humor in this world. An expelled person is more likely at any given moment to be in the moment instead of just in his head. The crusader is always thinking about the arguments and about the strategies, but the expelled person is actually living life. It's not that this type of person isn't going to care about politics at all, but it's not the water in which he swims. It's, it's more. There's more to life than that. When he looks at you, he's going to see you, not a potential voter or, um, you know, a contributor or a volunteer. And going along with that then, such a person treats people as ends and not as means. Now, everybody treats others as means part of the time. It almost can't be helped. But you know you've got a crusader when basically everybody's treated like a tool in their toolkit. And of course, if there's no use for them, then they're ignored. You know, you've got somebody who's been expelled or has expelled himself when they're willing to spend time with people with no agenda. That's actually called friendship. Expelled people are able to admit the complexity of life and admit that they don't have all the answers and that maybe we never will. Um, and such people are comfortable admitting that they're not om omniscient and that they cannot, and their party or group or whatever it may be, cannot control everything and make everything better. So basically, this amounts to humility. Um, it's kind of the Augustinian position on life. You know, Augustine thought there was the city of man, right, and the city of God. The city of God was really uh, in its fullness only um, in the next life. The city of man was a place that was inevitably very imperfect because it was mixed up with original sin in his theology. Basically, human nature was just incapable of perfection. So when you meet somebody who is able to have that humility, who basically says, I'm not sure, I don't know, but I'm trying, I think this might be right, maybe not, you're more likely to find, you've, you've maybe found somebody who's expelled. If so, they are willing to adjust to changing circumstances because they can see the circumstances. They can notice that things have changed and they're not so hung up on being rigidly consistent that they cannot adjust. As a result of all this, someone who is expelled is more likely to be involved in meaningful 
relationships that are non-interchangeable because people are not tools or building blocks, but actual multidimensional beautiful human beings. Does being expelled mean that you can't be political at all? Not at all. As a matter of fact, the only way to truly be political in the old sense of the term, in the Aristotelian sense, for instance, is if you are expelled, if you are not ideologically possessed, because you have to be able to deliberate, you have to be able to think, and you have to be able to talk things over with your fellow human beings, and you have to be able to listen to them. And then you may have to make a compromise, and, and none of those things are possible for the ideologically possessed. Now, on the faith dimension, um, I know some of your, you are um, of members of a particular faith, some of you are not at all, but everybody should be interested in this phenomenon anyway. We have, as an example, politicized evangelicals and fundamentalists. Um, I'm speaking in the American context now. Not every evangelical or fundamentalist Christian is actually ideologically possessed, but it's, it's, it's a fairly large phenomenon within these groups at this point in time. It has certainly not always been that way. But if you think that these groups are not ideologically possessed, by which I mean that there aren't many of them who are, Check out what happens if a member of a particular church or denomination disagrees on things like what God wants out of people. Let's say he or she wants to have a serious discussion about gun policy or whether free market capitalism is all good uh, or where we should go with abortion law and policy. Or even more interestingly, see what happens if you disagree about some aspect of American foreign policy or welfare policy in America or all the issues surrounding race and racial justice. What's interesting is that oftentimes you don't have to disagree a lot, but even a little on some of these issues and you can get into a real big fight. I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't splits in church about bump stocks. But on a more serious note, an example of what can happen um, in a church has been talked about and chronicled really well by Pastor Brian Zond. He's an evangelical pastor. He heads up the Word of Life Church in St. Joseph, Missouri. And at a certain point in the early 2000s, um, he began to have a a sort of revelation, a personal transformation, you might say, based upon reading a lot of theology and just having an open mind that led him to exit dispensational theology, which I'm not even going to get into, but also to reevaluate some of the more um, conservative positions regarding uh, American foreign policy, um, how to deal with poverty. He became more critical of consumerist capitalism and so on. I listened to a series of talks and plenary sessions um, that the church uh, held earlier this summer and um, he and others talked about what happens when people break away and in his case um, when he changed his mind and sort of tried to more or less um, lead his church and, and teach his church what he was learning. Um, and of course, inevitably, it just caused, it caused an awful lot of um, breakups. A lot of people left. Many people that he thought were really good friends of him, of his, um, left without an explanation. But he said that, that they were leaving because they were dispensationalists and nationalists and therefore they couldn't stay in the church. I can kind of see why some people would be pretty severely threatened by a change in theology. Um, the nationalism issue is harder to understand as far as leaving the church goes. I can see people disagreeing, but aren't Christians supposed to actually kind of work things out with each other? 
Anyway, all that reminded me of Edmund Burke and what he had to say about the revolutionary preachers of his day, back in the days when the preachers were in, that he didn't like were involved in proselytizing for the sort of to make the French Revolution come to England. And he remembered, I'm just going to quote from the Reflections on the Revolution in France, on the forenoon of the 4th of November last, he says, Dr. Richard Price, a non-conforming minister of eminence, preached at the dissenting meeting house of the old Jewry to his club or society, a very extraordinary miscellaneous sermon in which there are some good moral and religious sentiments and not ill-expressed, mixed up with a sort of porridge of various political opinions and reflections. But the revolution in France is the grand ingredient in the cauldron. Few harangues from the pulpit, except in the days of your league in France, or in the days of our solemn league and covenant in England, which, by the way, refers to the uh, league between the English uh, church and the Presbyterians and the, and the parliamentarians on both sides uh, to cooperate in their revolution against the king in the 1640s. So few harangues from the pulpit have ever breathed less of the spirit of moderation than this lecture in the old Jewry. Supposing, however, that something like this moderation were visible in this political sermon, yet politics and the pulpit are terms that have little agreement. That was Burke again. Burke's point was that the that Reverend Price had basically become a political operative rather than a minister. He elsewhere basically suggests that he's trying to become a political pope of sorts. I don't know where Burke would stand on having your faith influence how you reason about your political positions, but I suspect that he would not have a problem with that in his speeches, for instance, for instance his speeches against uh, the governorship of Warren Hastings in, in India. Um, he certainly did bring up Christian morality in his own talks about how terrible Hastings' administration was. So I don't believe he had a problem with allowing faith to guide your political opinions, but I do think that he saw a difference between that and basically making politics your faith. And he thought that's what Reverend Price and his ilk had done, that they had become basically revolutionaries who were using the pulpit to incite the people to more or less um, do their bidding. So this is faith ideological possession. And the faith path out, I would think, would have to be, first of all, to try to think and interpret the scripture for yourself. I know that uh, it's crazy, right? Um, to some people, maybe particularly to Catholics, and maybe for good reason, that the first thing to try would be to really um, try to take the lens off of you know what what you're told um, it says and read it carefully for yourself. I think people who do that would find it hard to have everything neat and tied up and, you know, tidy. But I would also think until you did that, you wouldn't really be a Protestant, for instance. I, I, as I recall, Protestantism um, had a lot to do with, you know, the notion that individuals could read and interpret the scripture for themselves. But it seems like these days almost everybody... Um, falls back on a script that's written by somebody else. So because so many people are, whether they know it or not, influenced by one particular theology, uh, it really helps to read multiple theological positions. I know not everybody's got the time to do that, but you could certainly do it online and just listen to some. Listen to different, um, you know, pastors talk about different positions. I'm talking about the Christian position here in particular, but I know um, that there are many other faith paths. I would think the same thing would apply to them. I like the phrase, model the master and not the pastor. Um, and in the Christian context, that's Jesus. It's interesting that if you think about um, the life and teachings of Jesus um, and 
and just kind of take them at face value, it's kind of hard to, to be rigidly ideological. It's good to listen to people like that, but they're not infallible. Another faith path away is to think more about action and less about reaction. The more that you think about what you want to do um, to kind of act out your religious faith, the less time you have um, to think about what's wrong with, with others or, you know, how to convert or how to spread your political ideology. Okay, so quickly, just a couple of other examples. Social justice warriors, yes, possessed, okay? Uh, I don't know, you guys probably all remember um, that video where a guy at a convention um, cracked the humongous joke and this gal just completely lost it. And, uh, I don't know, H3H3 made a video about this. Uh, it was hilarious, actually, sadly. She just went absolutely bonkers. She was triggered like you wouldn't believe. And somebody like that is obviously on a crusade and they're ideologically possessed. So, you know, if you have to share your political views on every occasion and if your mental space is taken over by multiple marginal identities, um, you are probably possessed, mainly just because your mind's on very little else. In the case of social justice warriors, you know you've got one if they encounter somebody who doesn't live the way they think you sh they should and they can't be comfortable around them, they can't just kind of tolerate them, you know you've got one. So, you know, if a person is uh, severely threatened, for instance, by a woman who wants to be a stay-at-home mom, if they practically can't stand sitting in, or being in the same room with them, similar to, you know, the people in the church who can't sit, you know, can't sit there because they're nationalists and you're not, <laughs> you know, you've got an ideologically possessed person. And the mirror image of social justice warriors are liberty crusaders. They are also possessed. Now, I've been thinking about Professor Jordan Peterson because, um, you know, he's, he's in the mix in all of this discussion right now. And I would classify him as a partial case because a lot of what Jordan Peterson has to say is pretty darn good, it seems to me, especially when he's dealing just with Jungian psychology or he's dealing with religion. He just did a, uh, an interview with a, um, an artist who does animation that was excellent. The only real problem is he seems to kind of obsess about what he calls neo-Marxists um, and liberals in the universities. Um, and that's just kind of what we used to call a bugbear. Yes, they do exist, and yes, he kind of got dissed by them up in Canada. And yes, that's a problem when your government basically tells you that you have to use certain words. I don't think that would ever fly in America with the First Amendment. But are these neo-Marxist liberals numerous and powerful and, you know, ready to topple all of Western civilization? No, they're not. In his mind, for whatever reason, they're a huge threat, probably because of what happened to him. I had a ser similar experience when I was just starting out, and I felt the same way. But after a while, I did realize that not only are they kind of toned down and kind of conquered by the backlash, but also they never were a serious threat, and they certainly cannot bring down all of Western civilization. Peterson has a lot to say about these neo-Marxists, but he has nothing much to say about the nationalist and neo-fascist upsurge that we're experiencing around the world, not taking over universities, but taking over governments. It's a major phenomenon that anybody like him ought to be talking about a lot, especially since he has the intellectual tools and equipment to do so. But I think he's not aware enough of, of the size of the phenomenon because he's so concentrated on the bugbears in the nooks and crannies of universities. Universities are not the world. Universities don't run um, our governments. Universities don't run our political uh, parties. Quite obviously, in America, conservatives of the 
neoliberal type have dominated politics, the media, and even education for decades now. Yet despite that, folks like Peterson argue that some liberal holdouts in universities are severe threats to our children and to freedom. Think about that. That's crazy. It's over the top. It's too much. There's too much emphasis on this little group with next to no power. Liberty Crusaders are the mirror reflection of snowflake social justice warriors in their hyperventilation about how oppressed they are. Burke wrote of the ideologue phenomenon, I will venture to say that this narrow exclusive spirit has not been less prejudicial to literature and to taste than to morals and true philosophy. These atheistical fathers have a bigotry of their own, and they have learnt to talk against monks with the spirit of a monk. But in some things, they are men of the world. The resources of intrigue are called in to supply the defects of argument and wit. To this system of literary monopoly was joined an unremitting industry to blacken and discredit in every way and by every means all who did not hold to their faction. To those who have observed the spirit of their conduct, it has long been clear that nothing was wanted but the power of carrying the intolerance of the tongue and of the pen into a persecution which would strike at property, liberty, and life. That's Burke talking about the ideologues of the French Revolution. Notice that they learned to talk against monks with the spirit of a monk. In other words, they talked against those who were ideologically possessed on the other side with the same degree of zealotry as the other side. And this is what we see so much of right now. Notice that the goal is literary monopoly, or media monopoly as it would be interpreted in our day, and you know, a goal of blackening and discrediting in every way those who disagree, turning them into the evil ones that you cannot listen to. And that's the ultimate trick, is to say, those are evil, those are idiots, and you don't need to listen to them. In fact, it's dangerous to listen to them. They're dangerous people. Well, you know you've got somebody who wants to control your mind when they say, that's too dangerous. Don't listen to it. Think about this. Is that a new, is that a true uh, message of liberty? Don't listen to that. It's dangerous. What about the free marketplace of ideas? Where did that go? As far as the intellectual path out, I would think it would have to do with admitting intellectual fallibility or intellectual blindness as a possibility that you have actually not got the equipment to know everything um, and to see everything, that in fact you're not God, which I believe is the Jungian teaching, that we are not gods, we cannot see and know everything, and so we need to basically admit this to ourselves and be open to the possibility that we are wrong. I think a great way to start the process is to read political thought without a guide. In other words, to read the original and to not read or listen to um, those who tell you what this you know, group is all about, this group of philosophers or this particular person, until you read for yourself and think about it for yourself. Going along with this is resisting binary thinking. We think in terms of good and evil, left and right. There may be positions, especially in the left and right area, that are beyond both of those, that are different from both of those. Those categories have not been around forever. They are inventions of a particular time, and particularly the Enlightenment, and we may be moving well beyond them now. To that end, think about how many times ideological truth has actually changed throughout time and space, and it kind of humbles you. You may not be right. Another trick I would think is to, to think about what you really value as opposed, as opposed to what you're told to value. I know they may seem like the same thing, but if you really think about it and maybe even make a list, you may find that what you're told to value by your particular um, ideology is, is not what you actually in your heart value. Maybe in your heart you really do value your family first. Think about whether your ideology would actually put your family first. 
does it really? Or maybe it, you think that your faith should come first. Does your ideology really allow you to put your faith first? In other words, is there really a clash? So this is something to just think about. And finally, attempt to befriend people rather than trying to convert them. Those are two very different things. Befriending somebody means attaching to them regardless of their difference from you and regardless of their flaws. Should we choose our friends on the basis of whether they're members of the NRA or the ACLU? Probably not. Anyway, more to think about, and next time I will try to move on to political movements.